Back in the day, the VW Beetle was simple and it was slow. This thing is still simple, but with the gear that it's got on it and the V8 engine in the back, I definitely wouldn't call it slow. Now with the front bonnet off this thing, you can see that it's no normal 1970s VW Beetle. And before you guys try and tell me that it's not a 1970 model because it's got an oval shaped rear windscreen, that was put in by the owner later on because he found it somewhere, welded it in and he thought it'd be funny to have an oval shaped window in the back. Now Warren, being a fabricator himself, has built this thing over nearly 35 years and there's been a whole bunch of iterations ending up with this. And it's a absolute work of art with the whole suspension set up. He's got all of the Fox suspension. He's got the crazy power steering set up on the front here. No engine, being a V-dub, the engine's in the back. We'll get to that in a little bit. But up here is where the beauty is. On each of the front corners, we've got a pair of Fox two inch by 10 inch shocks. One being a triple bypass for fine tuning the suspension and the other being an adjustable coilover running IBAC 200 over 250 pound springs. In order to be able to steer this thing, we've got a power assisted steering rack on the front. So yep, full power steering using the factory power steering pump on the V8 engine in the back. It's got the normal steering wheel comes down through the steering shaft into the rack. The rack would normally have the control arms coming out either side. However, they're blocked off in the boot and all of the steering is done from under the rack on this particular setup. That helps with the bump steer. Uh, interestingly, the reason why it's got the wobbly boot ends because if we go lock to lock, the rack end will actually come out the side of the rack. So that's there to protect that and keep all the dirt out. Off-road racing is a uh, sport, it's, it's similar to rally where you uh, are timed on a, on a track, um, but it's different in the way that uh, you've got the, the bigger jumps and the creek crossings. And the tracks usually vary from five kilometers to up to 250 kilometers point to point. Um, most tracks are in a loop, uh, so you generally go out, have a look at the track, know where you're going, navigator will then point out the arrows and help you steer along, especially in the dusty conditions, they help you to see where the track goes. Braking on this Bajar buggy is not what you would expect of your typical race car. In fact, if you look at the discs on the front, they're tiny. And the calipers, well, they're off a Mazda 323. Admittedly, it does have a pedal box inside. It has got a Willwood master cylinder, so I think it's two and three quarters of an inch for the braking. Uh, it's got a single piston caliper on the front and it's got a four piston caliper on the back. So in this particular setup, these guys use the rear for the braking rather than the front. A little bit different to what we're normally used to seeing. Electronics wise up front, it's a Bajar buggy. The truth is, I don't have much to talk about. We've got some LED lights at the front that are the driving lights, the headlights, the parkers. That's it. I did say it's pretty simple and it really is. On the sides here, we've got some, um, some canvas or some jumping castle material. That stops the dirt from going into the driver's cabin. Well, when I say that, it sort of stops the dirt, but you'll notice up here, it's got no windscreen. So the guys have to wear helmets. They have to use helmet fans that put positive pressure in the helmet so that they don't get full of dust and they can still see where they're going. Down here on the suspension is pretty interesting. So this is like a seatbelt style material that's from here, from the top of the suspension tower, we'll call it, down to the control arm, and it's held back by a spring. What's going on here is as this thing gets airborne, this is to limit the droop of that wheel so that it doesn't bottom out the shock and destroy the seals and the shock absorbers. We've got a spring hanging off that, which allows it to pull it away from all the moving parts so that nothing gets worn out. Remembering that this thing can do events up to sort of 400 kilometers. So all of this stuff, born out of necessity, born out of experience. The guys have obviously seen these rub through on wheels or get caught in the springs and get damaged. So all this sort of stuff, this ingenuity, I'm really into this sort of part of it because you can see what the guys were thinking when they were doing it. Over the years, the, the Baja behind me has evolved. Uh, started off with a, an Astron uh, motor in it and a combi gearbox. Um, basically had standard suspension still, so standard beetle arms on the front, 
and uh, IRS Beetle rear arms in the back. Final stage where it is now is where we uh, fitted the Lexus V8 into it. And to be able to hold that power without blowing gearboxes, we've also got the AGB album's gearbox in it. One of the things I love about this car uh, is uh, the wheel choice. This has got the Method Race 103 wheels. They're a billet wheel. They've got the bead lock. They're a lovely thing. And it's got BF Goodrich Mud Terrain TAs on the front. That's the KM3 and they're a 32 by 10 inch. On the rear, it's got the BF Goodrich Baja TAs that are 35 by 12 and a half. And these wheels are all 15 inch diameter. Uh, one of the things that you do need to do when you're racing a car like this with staggered wheels, so obviously it's got a much larger wheel on the back than it does on the front. That's why it's got a spare tire at the front and a spare tire at the back. Now that we've got that beautiful method race wheel off the top of the engine, here it is, the Toyota 1UZ. So this is a four litre V8 engine Produces about sort of 250 to 300 horsepower at the engine. It's mated to a manual Albans synchro mesh style gearbox. The Toyota 1UZ has made its name as one of the most reliable V8s over the years, so far so that it was one of the first V8s that was actually authorized for use in light aircraft. Interesting thing. The reason why the guys have chosen this thing, it's reliable, just like the rest of the car, and it's reliable in factory form, which I think is absolutely amazing for an engine of this era. Like I said, it's the Toyota 1UZ. It's the four litre quad cam V8. It's got a timing belt on the front of the engine that comes up to one gear per bank. That one gear then drives two gears that control either of the camshafts. It's got sequential injection, and it's got a twin distributor ignition setup. Keeping in mind that the guys have left this all dead standard because for the type of power this car needs and the reliability it needs, that's the way that it works. So it's got a distributor on one side of the engine and a distributor on the other side of the engine with a coil. Then that coil's high tension lid comes up to the distributor cap, out of the distributor cap to four cylinders, same on the other side. This engine's been in the car for 10 years and it's still a factory unopened engine. It's got a factory throttle body, factory idle control motor. Everything is as standard. Um, the intake system is a little bit different. It's got a super high tech airbox because for this type of racing, there is so much dust everywhere that you need the best filtration you can get. Um, unlike the V-Dub in its natural habitat, it does have green coolant over here, it comes up through a radiator that's mounted up the front here, then comes back down through here, through the factory water pump. If you've ever had the fortune or misfortune of changing a starter motor on a 1UZ, you would know that the starter motor is normally located under the inlet manifold. A couple of cars do it, absolutely crazy, and I'm sure mechanics love the engineers that design them like that. This one is a little bit different because it's got the Albans transmission. They've actually located the starter motor on the back side so that you can get to it nice and easy. The, the thing I like most about off-road racing is the, the fact that when you're out there, you're basically racing against yourself. You're not racing against other people. Unlike um, like circuit racing where you go around and you're trying to hit that same apex every time. Um, in off-road racing, you go around a track and the next time you come around that track there might be a massive hole there because you know 40 to 80 other cars have been through there dug out a, a big big hollow in the in the ground and uh, so you just got to keep your wits about you and race to what you can see every lap on the rear of the thing we can see the tatum four piston caliper on the still quite small brake disc, and like I was saying on the front, something that we're not really used to seeing in race cars, having bigger calipers and discs on the rear than we do on the front. But where the action is happening here is in this suspension setup. That is where the technology is in this car. On each rear corner of this thing, it's got a two and a half inch by 14 inch Fox shock being a triple bypass and another being a two and a half inch by 12 inch adjustable coilover. That's running IBARC 450 springs over 500 pound springs. 
Uh, the most important part of, the, uh, of an off-road car is the suspension. Um, because of the tracks uh, that we run on have got such, uh, you know, rugged terrain, you're going over jumps, you're going through creek crossings. Um, you need a car that can handle the bumps. Um, it doesn't matter how much power you've got, if you can't get it to the ground and you can't get a nice smooth ride. If you're bouncing all over the place in the car, then it doesn't matter how much power you've got, you're not going to go anywhere. Well, I haven't been this nervous in a VW since driving the Mighty Car Mods Miss Daisy, which was the EJ20 powered bug. But this thing is giving me plenty of those vibes. And the handlebar over here, that is seriously just a handlebar for the passenger to hold on to. So that's kind of showing you what I'm working with. Now, normally this is the time where I tell you all about the engine management system and the dash and the power distribution module and the keypad. But like we talked about before, this thing, very, very, very basic. It's back to the, the V-dub. It's a very simple thing. On the dash here, we've got two gauges. We've got oil pressure and we've got water temperature. That's it. We've got no taco. We've got no shift lights. You dead set, drive this thing like you stole it. With the keep it simple method, all we've got at the top, we've got a battery key. We've got our ignition switch, our start button, our helmet blower, and a bunch of lights. Basically, all the lights are on as soon as you're driving the thing, that's it. Engine management wise, this car has a Haltech E11 V2 from back in the day. It's mounted in the back here, it's controlling the engine, that's basically all it's doing. Everything else is wired so that as soon as you turn the power on, everything's up and running and it's all action and it's all go. This car's got a conventional clutch pedal and then we've got all of our master cylinders under the dash here. We've got our brake fluid and our clutch fluid over here in the cylinder so we can see the level while we're driving. It's got a conventional H-pattern style gearbox. Not a lot to tell you, to be honest. It's got the comms radio between the driver and the passenger. So in the helmets, you're plugged in so you can hear what the passenger's saying. You've also got a mute button here. So if you don't like what they're saying, you can just mute them. Safety wise, again, Pretty straightforward of a car. We've got a fire extinguisher underneath. And then if it all goes absolutely pear-shaped, we've got our SOS sign. Or if you're in the bush and everything's okay, except you've just come off and you can't get her started anymore, she's all okay. Rounding off the safety equipment, we've got these seatbelt cutters on either side. So if you do end up in the dirt or upside down or upside down in a lake or upside down in a lake on fire, you can rip these off. That'll slice your seatbelt so you'll be able to unbuckle whatever you need or slice the whole thing off and get out safely. The cage in this car certainly feels intimate and that's because it's right in on us. So this car is a very narrow thing anyway, but the cage started design and started building around the rules that Warren was following that the car couldn't be widened, it couldn't be changed. So the cage has been built inside the VW body. And interestingly, there's only a couple of bolts now that are actually holding this whole thing to the chassis. So if we took all those bolts off, you can actually pull the whole VW chassis off the thing and drive it around with no lid at all. Out the back here, this is where the radiator is, right here. I can nearly touch it, which in a normal car would be a disaster because it would be so hot and it wouldn't get any airflow. But, I don't know if you can see where from where I am, there's no windows, there's no front window, there's no side windows, there's no rear quarter windows. So we've got a whole bunch of airflow coming straight through, straight through that radiator, cooling the, the coolant, cooling the engine, and keeping the drivers cool, well hopefully, depending on the weather. But that's where it's so dusty and that's why they've got helmets, they've got visors, and they've got that positive pressure pump for the helmets to keep all the dust out. Finishing off with the VW styling, it's still got the factory beetle mirrors, it's got the factory door handles, the factory latches. It's such a cool car. And look, I really hope I get the opportunity to hold onto this thing and do a few laps in this. See that suspension working, see that full 16 inches of travel front and rear as we're launching off things in the dirt or, or in the mud or wherever we can end up. I, I really hope I can wheel and deal and get a ride in it. As always, thanks so much for watching. My name's Scott, catch you next time. 
Thanks for watching guys. If you like this video, smash that like button. We put out a new video every week and sometimes even two. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more awesome content.